it's a pleasure to me to also bring from the European Space Agency the congratulations for the an anniversary and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be in Finland, of course. So I'm very happy to tell you about Gaia. It was also nice to hear already a very positive comment earlier for Gaia, so I don't have to do such a heavy work of convincing you because the convincing has been done already. So let me just uh, directly start from the summary of what is happening. So as already mentioned, it's a survey of uh, over a billion stars. It's a cornerstone mission of uh, ESA. It's a European only enterprise, and I'm not saying that uh, it's important to be European only, but I think it is good for Europe to have some missions which are Europe only. It has a strategic uh, value that we demonstrate, although we don't have doubt about it, but we demonstrate that we can do missions ourselves as well. And Gaia is such a mission. And we are, of course, basing our mission on Hipparchos heritage. So it's not the first thing what, uh, what Europe is uh, doing. We, we have done it before, and now we do it better. What Gaia is doing, astrometry, positions of stars, but also doing photometry and spectroscopy, where the spectroscopy is mainly to do the velocities of the stars, just to use the Doppler effect. Actually, it could be three different missions. If you look just the spectroscopy part, it is already worth a mission. If you look the photometry part, it's worth a mission. And then you have the astrometry part, which is the absolute key. It's something which you cannot do from the ground. It's beyond anything you can even try. So that is the key thing where you have to go to space, and when you do all these three things together, you get a, you get a beautiful database. It's done a little bit differently than many missions, in the sense that everything is built by industry for Gaia. There is no uh, university group or institute who is building instruments, and the main reason was that you have to be extremely stable, so the system element becomes quite important. You have to have the thermal control and everything with the satellite, that everything is in a closed loop, it's very difficult to make the interface to a payload module if it's done by a different party than the main party, Prime, who is doing the service module, for example. Uh, ESA has the role of the manage overall management and also the operation part is on ESA hand. And then, where do the scientists come in? It's the data processing consortium. 450 people who are working all over Europe, practically every country in uh, ESA member states, and some even outside, are, are working on Gaia data. We are in the air. We launched last year, just before Christmas, and we are still in the commissioning phase, and I will give some update of the commissioning status, and as soon as that's finished, uh, we will start the nominal five-year operational period. We are at Lagrange point two, so 1.5 million kilometers away uh, from the Earth, the other side of the Moon. We don't like the Moon, we don't like the Earth, we don't like the Sun, so we put them at one side and look to the other side. That's what, what we want to do. Um, I will come uh, later to, to why it takes a while before there will be results. So that's one thing you need with Gaia, you need some patience. It's intrinsic for the way we measure. But there will be some uh, alerts uh, uh, early on, just a sort of side comment. Gaia will see every day eight new supernovae. So we just alert them out, and people who are following supernovae can already tag into the Gaia uh, outcome. Uh, no need to put any, any notes, everything is on the web available and you can collect uh, more information there. <coughs> just going through very quickly something just before the launch. So Gaia went in two pieces, the Sun Shield and the spacecraft itself. They went in separate uh, Ukrainian company, Blue Antonov, uh, to, to Kuru. And they were put together, tested one more the opening of the Sun Shield. And here it is put to the uh, launch adapter. This is sort of September last year. And uh, towards the Christmas, we had the Fregat uh, uh, fourth stage, and Gaia was combined to that one also in, in Kuru just before the launch uh, campaign. And then the Fregat, together with Gaia, was put into the nose module. And it was our quality guy, the last hole open, put his head into it, see the Gaia is in, hit the box and the lid was closed. Gaia is in the nose module. So we know it went. And then we had not only Ukrainian part, but we had also Russian part. Uh, Gaia was launched with uh, Soyuz, and it was just rolled out in one early morning, getting out. It's, it's green, by the way, and it is the correct Ukrainian code. Engine. It's Ukrainian a it's engine. Ukrainian engine. Uh, the green color of Soyuz is correct, and uh, we always see them white. It's because when you fuel it, it gets a frost layer on top of it, but 
Sukavoy's uh, grill. We had this, it was very smooth, there was only one delay. Uh, when the, in front of the big doors, uh, there was a snake uh, <laughs> waiting, and uh, nobody had the courage of the project to really go and grab the snake, so we had to call the, the fire brigade of Kuru, and then the Rambo came and took the snake, and then the soil came, and it all went fine. And then we have a white soyuz being launched, and uh, it was a beautiful moment. I mean, if you want to be a space researcher, there are a couple of really emotional moments in, in a career, and launch event is definitely one of those. Um, it was the whole week. It was low clouds, drizzle, and rain every day, except one day. There was only one cloud. That was the 19th of December, and we saw Gaia disappearing. Uh, for minutes, we could see it flying over us and uh, disappearing to space. And then uh, just uh, one day later, it is just... Uh, it's really gone. It's really gone. It's really just a streak. Uh, you need a real telescope to see it and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and observe it. It's, it's a funny feeling. You're in Kuru. Everything wants to information from you because you know what is happening with Gaia. Off it goes and you are there with empty handed because you know nothing. You have to call down stuff because they are over the telemetry. And only they know what is happening. And you really feel that you lost something because it, off it went to, to into space. Okay, what I want to now skip, I come back to the commissioning phase at the end, end of my presentation. I will go first uh, in between to say a little bit what is the science and what is the principle of what we are doing. Clearly, I'm not going to cover everything. I will limit myself to the key thing. And I, I start with, uh, with the parallax. So we use the parallax to determine distances. Now, why do I, why do I mention this one? A few weeks ago, we had a school event with uh, Gaia. We had some 2,200 uh, school kids across Europe. We were telling what Gaia is doing. And it's very nice because you, Gaia is so simple. What is, it's so simple that you can make at a class, look at your finger, blink your eyes, you can get the distance. If it's something further away, look at it uh, from one angle, walk to the other side, you see it. And then you can explain. Well, we do the same thing. We just use the orbiter of the sun to do the same thing to get that long baseline. And the kids, they understand it. They like it because, ah, it's not so difficult. It makes sense. You can actually uh, do it and, and understand what we are measuring. Of course, a lot of complexity you leave out. But the, the basic principle of measuring parallax and uh, getting how do we get the distance is, is uh, rather straightforward. So if it's so simple, why is it so difficult? The first one was uh, Herrn Geheimen Rat und Ritter Bessel, who 1838 managed to make the first proper parallax measurement. And the reason is that it's, uh, it's a rather small angle. Um, if you just look the easiest ca case, look the closest star, Proxima uh, Centauri, it's 40 beta meters away from us. Uh, everyone likes the light years. We of course use the parsec because that's related to the parallax. So it's the inverse of the parallax uh, angle. So the easiest case is uh, just below one arc second. Um, it's always difficult. What, how, how, what is one arc second? How big angle it is? You can always find, try to find these comparisons and there are the coins or mm. here at 20 kilometer or coin at uh, 100 kilometer or whatever and it's it's always very tricky. I'm not saying that I managed to do better, but uh, you can have an imagination of the moon, and you slice it to 2,340 slices, and that's that's the movement. What you see is the apparent movement of Proxima Centauri, and then you have the distance of it. But of course, we don't want to measure only the closer star. Actually, when Gaia is going to measure Proxima Centauri, we get the distance to six digits. That's uh, laboratory measurement. So our laboratory expands in the solar system to the closest stars. But what we really want to do, we want to see a bit further. And you see the problem immediately. Small angles for close by stars, you want to reach at least to the galactic center. And then we are talking about distances over eight and a half kiloparsecs. So you have to have, uh, make an effort to do this uh, measurement. So <coughs> what do we have? We go to micro -accessors. Again, the problem of a coin in the moon or whatever, how do you, how do you explain what does it mean? Um, now you just have to think the moon 
and instead of 2,300 slices, you have to put it into 257 million slices, and then you are at the 7 microaccident level of, of accuracy. Now clearly, when you do this kind of measurement, you must have an extremely stable spacecraft, otherwise it simply doesn't work. So all the thermal, you don't want any moving parts at all, also our antenna is, cannot move, it's just electrically steered, everything is stable. We don't want to be even when we are reading stars, because sometimes you see more stars than in other times, so it create more heat of the electronics of the CCDs, and it would disturb and distort. So we are fake reading all the time the same amount of stars, so that when we read less stars, we don't get the thermal imbalance to the detectors. Uh, but there are also scientific elements in when you do very high accuracy measurements. Relativity. When you go to micro second uh, level, uh, you have to worry about uh, uh, bending of light. Sun, of course, better, even if you look to the opposite direction, you have to take it into account. But it's not enough. You have to worry about all the planets. So every photon which is coming from the celestial target, it's actually when it comes to the solar system, it starts to be <coughs> having a slalom towards us. And we have to take it into account. And what we have to do is, of course, because Gaia is moving, Gaia is spinning, so you're looking at different direction, and the planets are moving. So every photon, in a way, you have to worry about what is the relativistic correction I have to do to here, because otherwise you don't know where it came from. And that is, of course, one of the big machineries. How do you do it at one microsecond level? You deal with the relativistic correction. And it's, it's, it's a scientific work, which has to be done, and there's a group who is doing it uh, in Gaia. Now the target, our Milky Way. Um, this is a panoramic thing, so 360 degrees, so you're looking in one direction, but what you're then looking at the edge is what is at the back. So you get a uh, feeling that, well, it's not totally homogeneous, there is some, uh, some uh, flattened structure, what you're observing, but from this picture, you cannot really see much more. So if you want to have a selfie, referring to the earlier talk, it gets tricky. You cannot travel out. We think it's something like this. Well, we know a little bit more, of course. It's not only thinking. We think there are spiral structure which we can observe in our Milky Way. But we cannot go and make this picture of the Milky Way. The only way is to measure. So looking back to this one, you cannot see from this picture what is the spiral structure. You have to go and measure the individual stars, and then you put into the right distance, you put it in your computer, and then you fly over and make a selfie of, of our Milky Way. Just to illustrate what is the real problem here, I take a picture of Bares window, so very close to the galactic center, and uh, what you, so apart from the two globular clusters, uh, which are here, which are far away at, uh, behind the galactic center, here are stars which are close to the sun. Here are stars which have the six kiloparsec spiral arm. Here are stars which have the three kiloparsec spiral arm. And here are stars which have the bar which is around our galactic center. But you don't see it unless you know the distances. So what you have to do, you have to measure them all and all the distances. And that's what we do. How do we do it? Um, what is the reads? Of course, Gaia is, is, is measuring, it's a, it's a magnitude limited sample, so you observe to a certain distance. But what do you get is, of course, a convolution of how sensitive you are and where the stars are. So what is the uh, final catalog going to be? It's a sort of density of sources. Well, we get most of the sources close to the sun, simply because there are lots of faint guys. But we do have enough statistics to really reach the galactic center and beyond, so we can truly probe the galactic structure. We have enough sample in the sort of half a galaxy uh, size of the, of the Milky Way. And if I do the same, this is actually sort of best imagination, artist impression, what we think our Milky Way looks like. It's of course not the real measurement, it's painted. Um, if you do the same uh, density plot of sources in this uh, uh, top view, you can also see that we reach uh, the galactic center. Uh, actually, we, we, we will be very doing very well also outside from the plane, but we just ran out of stars there at some point. So they will be very few there, but simply because there are very few stars. But um, 
in the basic thing of, uh, of, of doing science, it's not only the distances what matter, but also the, also the uh, motions. We want to go into dynamics. So stars uh, are also moving, so it's very simple. If you have the time, you just uh, measure positions over a long time, and you get the uh, motions of stars. And this is quite interesting also, that here is actually the very old uh, data has a lot of value. Because how do you beat the thing uh, of uh, getting accurate measurement? You either do, in a relatively short time, two extremely accurate measurements, or if you're not so accurate, you wait for 100 years. And we can wait for 100 years. I think the plates made for the Cart to Seal project in 1890s, they, I think they're somewhere here, probably, somewhere in Kumpula. And that's sort of more than 100 years ago. You can do very good proper motion stuff, but you have to find the plates, you have to measure them, and some work to be done. But you can do it. You can do proper motions with Gaia, you can do it also with old data. What is the basic principle of Gaia? So we have the parallax, it's the bubble of stars which is apparent, and then we have the true motion, which is the proper motion, and it's the combination of what we see. So what do we do? We observe about a billion stars on the average times over a five-year period, and then we just fit. So it's just a, actually it's just a least square solution. The nasty thing is, of course, that there are quite a few rows, and there is no way to know precisely enough where the spacecraft is, is looking at. So at the same time, we have to solve also the attitude of Gaia. We don't care about it, really. But otherwise, you don't get the stars unless you solve also for the attitude where the spacecraft is looking to. So we will probably have the best ever solution for kinematics of a spacecraft. So if anyone's interested, we have it. But what we want to get out is the solution for the stars. And it, this, is just, this is a mathematical problem. So it's a matrix which you cannot invert. You have to solve it iteratively. So it's a major effort has been to find the algorithm how to do it in a, a calculation time, which is sort of not spanning years. So um, the movement, one of the things which will be a sort of interesting to look at, uh, this is just the Sun, if you stars, how they are crossing uh, close by, is to get really complete picture. What is the next star which is growing so close to Earth that we get the new rush of comets? It's just uh, curiosity and interest of what will come like a side product uh, from, from Gaia. But what is the real purpose of, of proper motions is, uh, is to look into a little bit bigger picture. So these are just shots of uh, other galaxies from the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, these are selected. I mean, most galaxies, what you look at, of course, beautiful spirals, but these are special selection of interaction. So we do know that galaxies have, there is a lot happening. And uh, in the current idea of how galaxies form is that not only big collisions, but major part of the formation of them are collision of, uh, of small galaxies. And uh, if you look, uh, if you see it uh, properly, yeah. so something which in the old pictures you would see it's the normal uh, spiral galaxies, galaxies in the zone. Uh, we wouldn't see the faint stuff, but nowadays with the dynamic range uh, playing, you observe it uh, faintly. You can see that even quiet galaxies have marks that they have been eating, cannibalizing smaller galaxies. So we have a picture how galaxies evolve based on looking at other galaxies. But we don't quite know how our Milky Way fits into the picture. And now with Gaia, what is the good thing? Because our own galaxy is the closest by. So we can look in detail, we can look and test are the ideas how galaxies form, are they compatible, what we can observe with Gaia, then we are actually looking at all these individual stars which we see in these tidal streams. So, what do we do if we know where the stars are, uh, and we can deduce the mass distribution, then we know the uh, gravitational potential. If we know how they are moving, so we can also go back in time, where did they come from? We can go future in time, where are they going? So in principle, everything is solvable. Um, of course, it is a little bit tricky, because if you have a small galaxy here, it's just a few snapshots illustrated coming into a galaxy, just with a few passing by, it will be uh, stripped, and it will become very chaotic in a relatively short time scales. However, we can trace these processes back. There is a preservation of energy, there is a preservation of angular momentum, and we can use this one to, to trace back what, uh, what we see on the sky. The problem is that if here is the galaxy is taken out, so it's only the incoming small galaxy what you see here. Just very quickly, 
it stripped into parts. So if you're observing in the center of this one, you want to find these stars among the billions, but they are everywhere. They are not only that you, if I observe that direction, I guess, you have to observe the whole sky and select the right stars to make your modeling uh, that, and, and fit what has been coming in. And uh, the sad truth is, of course, that it's not only one guy which is coming in, but in a cosmological time scale, uh, when the galaxies have been forming at the certain periods, lots of small galaxies are coming in. It's uh, rather complicated. Uh, some of them merge, so after a while, you don't really see any traces. They just merge into the great uh, center of the galaxy. And uh, the, the uh, incoming uh, uh, new ones leave the trace for a while, for a few billion years maybe, and then that trace is again washed out. And in the end, what we get of course from our Milky Way with Gaia, it's only a snapshot, which happens to be, if you have a time to wait for five giga years more, we get the situation roughly at the moment of, of current epoch, when there are much less incoming galaxies, but still enough, according to theories, that we should be able to find uh, the traces of those incoming galaxies and test it against the models whether we see the galaxy formation in our Milky Way as we think it happens with galaxies. So let me just take it to an end. So we have a chaotic situation. It's just a similar kind of thing, a little bit uh, different kind of uh, different uh, work. And this gives a feeling. Why do we have to observe one billion stars? We think that maybe Gaia can detect 10,000 of these incoming galaxies. So you do need a statistic. Without the statistics, you, you just you are lost in trying to find the 10,000 incoming dwarf galaxies and the remnants of them from the Gaia data. Of course, most of the stars will be so old that they don't show this signature. But you have to find the right ones. And you don't know in advance which are the right ones. Um, going back a little bit to the more uh, dramatic uh, uh, happening. So this is Andromeda. It's coming to us. It's uh, towards our Milky Way uh, galaxy. Uh, and uh, we know roughly the speed. However, what we are lacking, it's also having a movement on the plane of the sky. And that movement we know, but not quite. And it's quite important if we want to know when does it hit us. We want to measure the plane of the sky movement. Well, Gaia will see here individually some few million stars, and we can measure the proper motion, so we can really deduce how it is moving in the plane of sky, and we get the radial velocity, and maybe it will hit us in two billion years, roughly. That's the sort of, I suppose, the best guess. So before the sun is gone, we will be hit by Andromeda. Um, and this is a sort of scare-making kind of thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if we would have dynamical range in our eyes, uh, this is the situation now. Uh, it is such a pity that we live in this epoch, because imagine, sort of two billion years from now, everything will be much brighter, it's all over the sky, I mean our whole mindset would be totally different. We would see just Andromeda galaxy in one side of the sky, and the other side you would just see actually nothing interesting, because this would dominate totally your vision. So we worry about uh, near-Earth asteroids, but, I mean, that's the real, real thing. <laughs> when that one hits, it's big and it comes quickly. Yeah. We then, have to just go through. <laughs> that's true. I mean, we have to worry about near Earth asteroids because they can hit. When this one goes, we have a feeling that there are stars very close by, but it's not true. We will not hit at all. They will just sort of interact dynamically, but the chance that anything hits is, uh, is very small. But there is some calculation, which I think is quite nice idea. It's again a philosophical idea almost. That if it hits, that there is a sort of 20% chance that at the first pass, our sun will be captured to Andromeda. So we will change the galaxy right. after 2 billion years with a 20% probability. Of course, in the end, it doesn't matter because it will all melt into one big elliptical galaxy. So then we are just in one galaxy anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, I, of the near Earth ast asteroids, there is also guy has a tiny little contribution. We, we, don't, we are not very good for near Earth asteroids because they usually move too fast. But if we get them, then we will give exactly tell you where does it hit. Because the positional accuracy 
is so high that we can really collapse all the errors in the orbit calculations of, of uh, near-Earth asteroids. Okay, I touched the first bullet very briefly, uh, structure and dynamics of the galaxy. But uh, as already mentioned, Gaia is really touching all areas of astronomy. If you're doing astronomy, from now on, you cannot ignore Gaia. You have to, you have to think about it what, it, what it brings to you. Because it will change the whole field. It will change astronomy. And you have to know <coughs> what is coming out if, if you want to follow what, uh, what are the latest uh, developments. I test, uh, I mean, for stellar astrophysics, I think uh, it will be really, the, finally one gets the distances to stars. It's something if I give a, give a presentation to professionals, I don't have to tell why it's important to get the distance, because everyone knows how difficult it is. If you are really at the general public level, the interesting thing is that you say, we are measuring distances, and you get like people looking with perplexed. And, Did, didn't you know? It looks like your whole credibility is gone, because people think that, of course you know the distances to stars. We don't. And that's going to really stay, uh, uh, change the stellar astrophysics field uh, completely. Uh, the exoplanetary systems, just picking another one. We are going to get maybe a few thousand new exoplanets. But what is the important thing of Gaia? We are not good for Earth, but planets, because the wobble, the Earth, is, uh, Earth mass is not enough to move stars enough to detect for Gaia. We are good for Jupiters. And why is it important? Because now we know there are lots of hot Jupiters around stars. So we know lots of planets, but very close to the star. It's not really an environment where we think is looking like our solar system. Gaia is going to be sensitive to Jupiter's at five to ten year orbits. It's much closer to a system what we have seen in, in our case. So that's going to be an interesting area. So I think for the 60 years uh, anniversary, I think you can already now pick a topic and then hopefully you get real results which have been analyzed uh, from, the, from the mission. Now, commissioning, what we are doing. Why did I agree to talk here? I thought that we are done and we are in a routine phase now, uh, but we are not. So we have managed to do uh, uh, commissioning for all the uh, uh, subsystems are working. All CCDs are working. Uh, we have enough power. Uh, we have uh, the uh, antenna is working and the transponder is working. We get all the data down. Um, we have focus, so this is one of the first things uh, we took, tested the default value, and the double spike is that we haven't yet focused. So this, is, this was one of the things, just to look at the, how we have to focus it. So now it's focused. Um, it's just a very bright star, so it was easy to see. It's totally saturated, but it was looking for the, for the focusing aspect. What is uh, the, the important thing with Gaia? Because we are moving all the time. If you want to make a very sharp picture and you're moving, you have to worry about that. So what do we do? It's not only focusing. We are reading the CCDs, the chip, with the same speed as we are spinning. That's the only way to keep your picture sharp. So that the picture moves on the chip as the satellite is moving. So we have had the month exercise fine-tuning the spinning speed of Gaia, so that the spinning speed matches precisely the reading speed of the CCDs. So that the clocking is exactly the same. And uh, we managed, so this is just a little bit more challenging. This is like a sort of Hubble space telescope quality image. The problem of putting this kind of images is that people think Gaia is making images. We are not. We can do it uh, now in commissioning, but in the future we are not going to do images. We just measure the stars and get the positions, only the positional information, and the rest is uh, we chopped away because we don't have the telemetry. And just to look a little bit the numbers of this one, so this is, this is 2.85 seconds of integration time, and it's just selected, of course very careful, one uh, CCD, uh, so it's about 1% of the focal plane, we have 106 CCDs in the focal plane. So 1%, 2.85 seconds, so we have a five-year mission. So that gives you a feeling of the quantities we are going to get, simply because it is a very efficient machine. So we are doing okay, but we do have a problem, and this is the problem that we have to try. We have some frost. So we have somewhere a water source, and uh, the water is coming and it freezes on the mirrors. The good thing is that we heat the mirrors and it's gone. 
so we get rid of it. But it gets coming back. The good thing is, again, that every time we have done now two rounds, it's less. So we are getting rid of it. We have now a small contamination of ice on the, on the mirrors of half a magnitude. Uh, we heat the mirrors and we get uh, rid of it, but we are now thinking, are we going to do it now? Or are we going to start next week with the routine phase? Or shall we just leave first with the half of magnitude loss, observe for maybe half a year, and then heat the mirrors? So we are balancing this kind of uh, exercise. And we are now, uh, today we are actually measuring that whether we can go to 21st magnitude. So the measurements are being done as I speak, and looking for the de detection parameters. So that's all in the decision making. Do we defrost now or later? Uh, eventually we do frost, a little bit less uh, dramatically, and then uh, we have a Gaia which will uh, change the science. And uh, I stop here. Thank you. Um, two things. I have to start working on my new identity as an Andromedan. And I used to think that space is empty, <laughs> but there's lots of stars. Any questions or comments? Here. If I would like to know the distances to some global cluster that about five kiloparsecs, when will I know them? Uh, that will be really at the difficult. That's a limit. It, you have to wait for several years. So you can do next week. No. So it's, uh, it's so the fundamental thing. What I mentioned uh, at the beginning is uh, is that the parallax you need at least a half a year, but actually you do want to have a little bit more points on this parallax curve. So you need only a few years, and then you do go to distant uh, objects like globular clusters, and then uh, you do want to have uh, the ultimate accuracy. So you want to have the collective more just than the first curve with the parallax uh, measurements. You want to have preferably the five years because then your errors uh, scale as. Uh, Square root of our time. So what's the error? Uh, uh, it's always uh, depends on the brighter stars. So it will be individual stars. And it's only at the edges because the global clusters are typically too dense from the middle. Uh, so you have to look. So if you have a 12 magnitude star, you have the 7 micro arc second parallax at the rest. Questions? It's probably coming from a service module with some uh, hole, which is not intentional, but we don't really know. So at some point it says something. Micro no, it's uh, it's uh, when you have lots of MLI or uh, carbon fiber things, they have uh, they have a lot of water from the ground, just in the structure, and it goes very slowly from the material out into the, and then it stuck it sticks to anything cold, because we have everything covered. So it's very difficult for the water mo molecule to find the aperture hole. So it finds always some wall and it sticks there in the first, or mirror. And the mirrors we can heat, so it's not a problem, we get rid of it. But then it just sticks somewhere else. Uh, I was going to say, it's probably the, the carbon fiber, which intrinsically carries a lot of water. But it will, it will go away yes. rather rapidly, yeah. no question. It, it is an annoying thing, but, uh, annoying, uh, but uh, it's not its not really a problem that we really are worried about. Other questions? But you have enough consumables to eliminate the start of the operative phase if you want to get rid of it. We have the perfect launch, so the chemical propulsion for big orbit uh, corrections, we have enough for whatever. That's not the limiting. For the spin, we, we use cold gas, so micro propulsion. So that is limited. And uh, the consumption is 13 grams per day. So we can go for 12 years. Questions? If you compare this with Hipparchus, Hipparchus will give you a bit longer time base, but is that data still useful to combine with Gaia? Our first planned release is to do the proper motions to Hipparchus stars. So, because then we have uh, the Hipparchus accuracy is, is, is good, then you have a measurement of Gaia, which is excellent, and then you have the time span of 20 years, which helps you for proper motion. So, we intend to do that. Mm -hmm. Which is what, 100,000? Yes, the brightest one we cannot do, but it's about 100,000. 
promotion. Then we get the first release, which is already scientifically extremely interesting. Yeah, which is not bad. Which is not bad. Yeah, maybe it's worth to mention one additional uh, application on, on Gaia, namely that uh, sooner or later we will have the new celestial reference frame based on, on that because uh, it's a very big change now. As I said earlier, we have this fundamental catalog 5 to VRBI based uh, system uh, from, from dynamic to kinematic, and now we will have uh, equal improvement after Gaia, so that's also also very very important application. I fully agree, and, uh, and uh, one thing what I, what I say in some audiences is in the future, every satellite which has a star tracker to do the guidance is based on Gaia measurements. Every observatory on ground who is seriously pointing the telescope to something will have a Gaia catalog in it. It's really the fundamental, the brick stones what we are laying with the mission of all kind of applications which most people will, not, will not, not, not even see, but the reference frame is one of the most important things I fully agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you said that you, you need to do the gravitational lenses, uh, lenses within the uh, solar system. Do you need to take into account quadrupole moment of Jupiter, or it's not uh, required that this accurate? We are measuring it. So okay. we have fine-tuned the spin phase in such a way that we have a bright star close to Jupiter in order to measure the quadrupole moment of Jupiter. So, uh, yeah. It's 30 micro second effect. I remember Sergei Klanier was uh, wrote a PhD thesis about exactly about this effect, and he was probably one of the guys who did this for this reduction. Yes, we, we try to do it. So we try to do fundamental physics as well. Okay, thank you very much.